Good afternoon, and welcome, Roomies and Zoomies in the interwebs. Um, I'm Sabrina Bocanegra, digitization archivist here at the APS, and I am pleased to start off our third panel of the day on historic open data by introducing our moderator for this session, Dr. Peter Logan. Dr. Peter Logan is Emeritus Professor of English at Temple University, Go Owls, um, and the past academic director of the Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio there. He specializes in 19th century British literature and history and has published extensively on problems in 19th century British culture. He also edited the Blackwell Encyclopedia of the Novel. In 2018 and 2019, he was a project mentor for the LIS Education and Data Science for the National Digital Platform Program, sponsored by the Metadata Research Center at Drexel University. Go Dragons. Currently, <laughs> Uh, he is the co-lead for XML TEI for the online diaries of Michael Field, uh, hosted by Dartmouth College. The project is publishing the first complete edition of Works in, in Days, the diaries co-written by the two women poets who published under the pseudonym Michael Field and lived openly as lovers for 30 years in the 19th century. He is also the director for the Knowledge Project, an, an effort to create a new data set for research in the history of knowledge. The project is creating accurate textual data from historical editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica with funding from the National Endowment for Humanities. Finally, he is presently writing the degree to which the concept of race subtended the history of knowledge in the Anglophone 19th century. Dr. Logan. Thank you very much. I hope I can live up to that. Um, first of all, let's bring our, our panelists up here so we can get started. Molly Nebbiolo, is it? Did I pronounce that right, Molly? Thank you so much. Uh, she is the 2021 through 2022 Friends of the APS Predoctoral Fellow in Early American History that is up to 1840. And she's also a fifth year PhD candidate in history uh, at Northeastern University. Uh, her work analyzes public health, disease, and urban space in the early Atlantic world. She worked in various capacities for the Women Writers Project, the Boston Research Center, the Digital Cities Research Network, the Center for Digital Scholarship at the APS, and the Digital Diary of John Quincy Adams at the Massachusetts Historical Society. From GIS mapping to text analysis, R programming to 3D modeling, she finds computational and digital tools to be an excellent way to further investigate the stories and the data of the past. Her DH work has been published by DH Quarterly and the Age of Revolutions online journal. The APS has also funded Molly's DH work with a 2019 through 2020 Digital Humanities Fellowship. Um, so I'll introduce the others as it's time for them to come up. So Molly, would you like to get started? Wonderful, awesome. Hi, I'm Molly Nebbiolo, um, and I have the wonderful coveted post-lunch panel. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I also apologize in advance. I had COVID a few weeks ago, and I still have some like flumminess and fogginess. So I apologize if I trail off 
if I'm like hacking away, it's okay, just leave me up here. Um, but I do hope to keep you awake during the next 10 minutes. And if I don't, that's okay. I know napping's really important, so it's fine. Um, so I'm coming today with more questions than answers um, and to provide an example of something that's really interesting that I found in the archives. And I hope that you'll find it interesting too. Um, instead of providing a polished database or a data set or a set of methods that I could give you, again, blame it on the, the COVID. I wanted to prevent or uh, present a really wonderful data set, and then I was sick. Um, so I hope we'll be okay with questions. Um, so to start at the beginning, um, this past fall, I conducted research at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and found this really, really fascinating record book, which is a handwritten album um, where someone, and I'm positing that it was a few someones based on the different handwritings, had written down all of the people who had died during the various 19 or 1790s yellow fever epidemics um, and any further information that they had for those people. So usually an age for some folks or occupations often only cropped up next to these names. Um, this was extremely interesting to me because it was prefaced with an apology for the incompleteness of the data, and I include that in my paper. So in case you want to read it, it's at the end, almost like an appendix. Um, and how this was a process of compiling data um, as the names were grouped by the burial grounds or the burial, burial ground records that this information was pulled from. So as you saw in my paper, the initials of the person who did this work in the mid 20th century is noted, but we don't know much else. So as of last week, when I reached out to the HSP, um, they only know that this was done by some um, researchers at the Genealogical Society in Philadelphia sometime in the 1960s or 70s before the record book made its way to the HSP. And the archivist uh, at the HSP said the original data came from a list of the dead that was written and included at the end of uh, this famous pamphlet written by Matthew Carey in 1793. Um, uh, and who had printed the information um, in this uh, controversial pamphlet during the epidemic itself. I'm quite um, unsure whether or not this is true because it also includes data from 1798 uh, um, and 1797 in those epidemics as well. And it includes further information that isn't actually included in that pamphlet, which I've looked at uh, digital and physical copies of, which are at the APS. Um, shout out to the digital library. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's actually true or not and whether or not the H HSP is aware of this. I hope to kind of uh, highlight some of the really interesting information that I found with this data set when I'm finished with it. So, you know, wow, what a find, you know, any PhD candidate or any researcher going into the archives and finding this really awesome compendium of data that was passed down from the burial records to um, then be reproduced in this, this kind of album of records. And now to me, hopefully digitizing it, I was just kind of blown away by this. Um, and based on my own research, this data wasn't actually kind of coming directly from Carrie's, uh, Carrie's pamphlets, and it contained the, the occupations and ages of some of these people that I've never found before. So I'm still unsure where this data is coming from, but it's really nice that the archivist at the Genealogical Society kind of made note of things and had their own 20th century version of a methodology at the beginning of the text. And I also wanted to highlight that what, what led me to the kind of the further questions that I'll talk about um, a bit now is um, that the numbers of those who had died in the 1793 epidemic in Philadelphia are still kind of unsure or, or not perfect. And, and there's certain numbers that kind of get replicated as people are publishing journal articles and books on the epidemic itself. So many times people say close to 5,000 people had died. Um, Kerry himself, and this number has been replicated over the course of centuries, have said that 4,031 people have died. Um, others have um, taken into account differentiating or including the deaths of uh, free and enslaved black peoples to say that 3,095 white people had died during the epidemic and 198 people, uh, black people had died. Um, but this data is set that I've found and have begin to transcribe, in 1793, it's under 4,000 people had died. Um, and of course, that is definitely an incomplete number, but what does it say as, as we're thinking about um, you know, replicating data or studying data or studying numbers or including these numbers as we're writing histories? Um, so thus far, as I have transcribed the 1793 epidemic data for the record book, which is approximately 78 pages out of a couple hundred pages 
total, um, and it was actually extremely time consuming. It is, um, if you look back here, it's three columns. It looks like it's not much because it's spaced out and the archivist has phenomenal handwriting, but it actually is extremely time consuming. Um, and the hope is to further segment out the data or as some say, clean it before making the data set open and available for users on Mead, which is the magazine for early American data sets housed at Penn. This process of transcription, I think, is a way of confronting the aspect um, or confronting this kind of 1793 data, as I note in my title for today's presentation. I wanted to confront this data set to see what new information I could find if this data provides similar or different numbers to the nearly 5,000 people that has been regularly circulated in books and journal articles on the epidemic. But the process of transcribing this data set has led me to some other interesting questions. So what do numbers actually tell us about historical data um, or what how does historical data provide us when we're thinking about numbers in this way? And can we fully rely on historic data to study the past? Um, I think obviously that the answer to the second question is no, we can't fully rely on this historic data or these historic numbers, but it's an interesting question to kind of grapple with when thinking about transcribing, providing, and reconceptualizing historic data. So I've been really fascinated by the way this widely written about history, that of the Philadelphia 1793 epidemic, perpetuated this number that Carrie had written or proposed, which was 4,031 deaths or its estimations. Yes, we'll never know the true number based on the discrepancies between record keeping in the 18th century and the way that we record data today, but can we trust historic numbers? Should we be confronting historic data to reconceptualize numbers or data um, as facts? The process of working with this data set has led me to consider how we can better work with historic data. In an ideal world, I feel like we could set standards for the way that we perpetuate historic data in our writing. If we aren't producing quantitative pieces, um, so quantitative analyses, chapters and dissertations that really look at hard data sets, should we do a better job of reviewing historic numbers as we perpetuate or investigate historical narratives? I found that many who write about the epidemic rely on, Carey at, uh, rely on Carey's words um, or give kind of a broader stroke estimate as a way of providing numbers without engaging with the historic data or these historic numbers. Should that continue? Um, I think it would be interesting if as journal articles or books are reviewed thoroughly, should these numbers that we use and this historic data that we use equally be reviewed? And in an ideal world, I think the answer is yes, if we had all of the time, the money, and the resources, but it's an interesting thing to consider. Additionally, what about the robust methodologies or background sections that usually come with or should come with these data sets? As we make data open source, what about all the extra stuff that goes with the data con to conceptualize it for the user? And here I'm thinking a lot about what Dr. Posner um, talked about last night in, in categorization. I also think conceptualization is something to consider um, as well or to think about as humanists that are, that are working with data. Does this help with the narrative, the accessibility, the accountability of providing data for others to use? To quote something that Lydia has said earlier this morning, and sorry to, to pinpoint you, Lydia, but you said this amazing thing. So in describing something, how do we keep from reducing it? And I find that detailed discussion around de um, decisions, our own DH practices and the like when providing data or interpreting historic data is one way to potentially keep from reducing data, like data around epidemic deaths. So these are all the questions that have been buzzing around my head and will continue to do so as a complete work on this data set and continue to grapple with historic data in my own work. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to shine a light on the applicability of this project too, as I'm sure that you've drawn these conclusions and I have when I was laying in bed with COVID. <laughs> so as of today, <laughs> the things I pondered, as of the today, the WHO has recorded that there has been 6,293,414 cumulative deaths related to our own pandemic. How will this number be used in future histories of the pandemic? And also, how does our own uneasiness towards this number uh, influence the way that we study historic data too? So I'm sorry to be leaving you with, all, uh, with so many questions, but maybe that's the point of this kind of work. Thank you. Our next two presenters are Amanda Sorensen and Dr. Katrina Fenlon. 
Uh, Dr. Fenlon is an assistant professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. She's also a faculty affiliate at MIF, which I think all of you know what it means, I hope. Her work aims to advance the capacity of communities and knowledge organizations to sustain meaningful, inclusive, impactful digital collections that, in turn, support the advancement of knowledge and the endurance of communities. Amanda Sorensen is a PhD student at the University of Maryland High School, uh, where, is she, where she is part of the recovery and reuse of archival data lab. She recently worked as an ANRI intern at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in 2019, she completed a graduate fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History. She holds an MA in Anthropology from the University of British Columbia, and her MA research focused on museum studies, specifically an exhibit on Northwest Coast art. Um, please welcome Amanda Sorensen and Dr. Katrina Fenlon. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for having us today, and thank you for helping us get it set up. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Thank you. So we're presenting on behalf of several more colleagues who couldn't be with us today, um, but their names are on the slide. And our research is focused on what you all have been talking about on recovering and reusing historical data. Um, but we're pointing our gaze to data recovery in support of science. Specifically, we're studying the practices of recovery and reuse in the sciences um, across disciplines and across organizational contexts. So you all are acutely aware um, that masses of potentially useful data are lying dormant in archival collections and beyond, um, also in uncollected piles of uh, material or digital files scattered across the research landscape. You might be surprised to learn how much of this data is useful to contemporary science, um, how much of it isn't in archives, but is instead in the basements of scientific research centers or in boxes of unpublished or gray literature um, or in unplugged hard drives or the files of retiring scientists. And you might also be surprised to learn how much data curation work isn't being done by curators, um, by librarians or by archivists, but instead being done by scientists themselves. Um, these data may be keys to advancing our knowledge, um, most obviously when it comes to longitudinal analysis of different phenomena, but because they've been forgotten or obscured or because there um, are just no people or no resources to care for them, they're at risk of being lost. This problem doesn't surprise anyone here, I'm sure, because it's deeply familiar to work in archives in the humanistic context. But in the sciences, the value of data to support ongoing research um, is less widely recognized outside of a, a few very prominent examples, um, like in climatology or in ecology. And projects relying on historical data represent a tiny niche of the research landscape. But the work of recovering data from the historical record is happening every day um, across all kinds of historical, um, organizational, and disciplinary contexts but the long tail of these data recovery efforts is largely invisible um, and usually siloed within a, within a discipline. Our study grew out of a partnership with the National Agricultural Library called the Digital Curation Fellowship Program. 
Um, one strand of this fellowship program was recently dedicated to having students from the College of Information Studies, which is where we're from, um, in positions of data recovery at the National Ag Library, specifically rescuing data from historical collections that the library held to add them into the Ag Data Commons Interdisciplinary Scientific Data Repository. As we were doing these case studies in data rescue, um, we found that the more people we talked to, um, the more we realized that there's more of this work happening across the sciences um, than is widely understood, most of it being done pretty invisibly, and that data curation as a sort of subdomain of archival science and library and information science that's dedicated to understanding management of research data is mainly focused on contemporary and future data. Um, and there's a need for this cross-disciplinary and empirical work on understanding data recovery, um, retrospective curation, we might call it, um, across disciplines. So our project seeks to understand the challenges and opportunities in this area, the value of data recovery for science um, and its requirements and the relationships among efforts across disciplinary contexts. What can we learn from what the scientists are doing? Um, what, can, what can we learn for curation practice in general? And what can digital humanities perspectives bring to the table? In this presentation, we're just gonna surface some of our preliminary themes, um, which Amanda will tell you more about. So to answer our research questions, we are conducting semi-structured interviews with scientists, archivists, science librarians, and individuals working with citizen science platforms. Currently, we have interviewed 20 participants. As you can see from uh, these graphics, they are working with a wide range of data types. They come from many different disciplines, and, and they hold many different roles within a variety of institutions. In our recruitment efforts, we have been intentional about capturing a broad viewpoint of scientific data recovery efforts. Before coding, the research team collaboratively created a codebook which identified key themes as they emerged across interviews. This table gives you all a sense of our codebook. Um, for example, one theme we identified is uh, data sharing challenges. A uh, description of this code is included along with a sample quotation which speaks to this theme. So as Katrina mentioned, this presentation highlights a few emergent themes um, that we plan to explore more fully in the future. Specifically, uh, this presentation will probe issues surrounding the potentials of historical data to generate new scholarship, the ethical dimensions of data recovery, and how historical data use and reuse can help address contemporary problems. One theme surfaced through this research details how rescued and recovered scientific data have the potential to support future scientific inquiry. In discussing joint projects which rescue paleontological data and information from fish records, two participants described how research questions can serve as a catalyst for data rescue work and vice versa, how data rescue directed at general use can surface new research questions. One participant thought out loud um, about how an institution making paleontological data accessible per its mission supports open-ended reuse possibilities while a different data rescue project is aimed at answering a specific research question. Another participant, a science librarian, echoed these thoughts describing how observational data generated by student projects have potential to serve longitudinal analyses of local biodiversity. They described reoccurring research in which a graduate student identified species along a transect line in 1931 um, in a body of water. And since then, a reoccurring undergraduate research course supported students in it continuing to identify species occurring along that same transect line beginning in the early 90s. They explained the value of the long-term observational data generated through this course and how the work of these students could perhaps unintentionally serve as this person describes as a window into the biodiversity of this institution over a long period of time. Scientific data rescue projects and initiatives can support open-ended future use and research, sometimes in unanticipated ways, um, and they can also serve specific targeted research questions. Participants also described ethical quandaries and choices in their data rescue work. 
one participant, a researcher and librarian, described how a coll collaboration that started to address issues around archival descriptions became refocused on recovering data related to water usage in order to support an indig indigenous nation's water claims. When it became clear to this participant that some of the issues they thought they would discuss, such as the use of native place names within archival descriptions, um, when they realized that this was not, um, not a top priority for those that they were working with, their work pivoted to provide spaces and information to help community, this community research their water use and support legal claims. These participants' perspectives indicate a potential of data recovery work to be responsive to community needs. During interviews, participants also pondered how curatorial and descriptive choices hold ethical weight. One participant described their considerations about making geographic data, which included lakes named after racial slurs, publicly accessible. This person discussed, discussed their choices, um, quote, to not just erase it, but also to not not comment on it. Another participant expressed their fear about using terms that would perhaps come to be outdated or harmful to different communities over time. Our preliminary findings of these interviews show how data recovery efforts surface both ethical challenges and opportunities. Historical data, whether located in archival collections, research center basements, or in published student papers, can serve as important data sets in understanding pressing contemporary problems. Data recovery efforts have long targeted climatological data due to the importance of longitudinal research in climatology. Spanning various scientific disciplines, many of the data recovery projects we explored work to make historic environmental data accessible and or answer new research questions pertinent to climate change research. One participant involved with making water data accessible, um, which I mentioned earlier, described how their data sharing efforts align with current environmental concerns, specifically how this data is a valuable collection and topical given current environmental concerns and the interests of the communities and researchers around them. Another participant echoed these thoughts in asserting the potential for agricultural data to inform evidence-based agronomy efforts and in studying climate change impacts more broadly. Their project recovers farming recommendations for phosphorus content and fertilizer which they predict might be used by scientists in the future who are trying to understand the role of phosphorus in geochemical cycles and its relationship to climate change. These participants suggest how recovered environmental data are serving new purposes within research projects or through greater accessibility. They have the potential to support new inquiries into climate change and environmental research. Through these avenues, data recovery projects are using or making available historical data sets to learn more about contemporary challenges, in this case, climate change. As demonstrated um, by the interviews um, conducted for this project, scientific data recovery opens up new vectors for the impact and usefulness of archival records. Our future work aims to investigate the outcomes and impact of data rescue initiatives on scientific reproducibility, data reuse, and public access to science. Within each of these themes, our future work will continue to identify the ethical implications of data recovery in different contexts, particularly in relation to data from and about vulnerable populations and places. We are currently conducting data analysis and finishing up interviews, which we anticipate will wrap up this summer. We plan to translate outcomes from this work into practical guidance for curators and scientists, and to expand this project to think about description work within the sciences, specifically how scientists and data curators are addressing harmful language within historical scientific data, and more generally, the ethical concerns surrounding scientific data rescue, recovery, and reuse. Thank you all for listening and to APS um, for their support in disseminating these preliminary findings. We'd also love to learn more about what questions and directions um, you all find most compelling um, as surfaced by this work. We are also still recruiting for interviews, so um, if you're interested in being part of this work, please get in touch. Thank you both. Um, our last presenter is Dr. Corey Maceo Johnson, uh, who has a PhD from Stanford in Modern Thought and Literature. He is currently a postdoc scholar at MIT, where he's affiliated with the Center for Research on Equitable and Open Scholarship. 
and also with their programs and digital humanities. He's the co-director of an MIT project called Documenting Indigenous Languages, which explores the Institute's sensitive archival holdings related to language preservation and reclamation. This research engages with the material repository of the late indigenous language specialist, Kenneth Locke Hale, um, and with the so-called Elliot Indian Bible uh, of 1663, which he'll talk about much more in the project, so I'll let him explain it himself. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to Adriana and Nathan for putting together such a great conference, and thank you to, uh, for the excellent presentations we've had so far. Hopefully this continues to touch on some of the themes that have been discussed. Uh, this talk provides an overview of the Documenting Indigenous Languages at MIT project, which was prompted by the challenges of dealing with the afterlives of linguistic data in material repositories, specifically the papers of the late uh, Kenneth Locke Hale, professor of linguistics at MIT. Throughout his lifetime, Hale worked to document languages of Aboriginal Australians, American Indians, and indi the indigenous languages of Central America. Uh, Hale also participated in language reclamation through the use of historical archives. Uh, pictured here is the so-called Eliot Indian Bible, which is the earliest translation of the Christian Bible into an in indigenous American language, and it was the first Bible of any type published in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, translated by Puritan minister John Eliot into the language variously known as Massachusetts, Natick, or Wampanoag, the Bible was published in 1663. Uh, it found renewed interest in the 1990s as the foundational textual repository used to reconstruct the Wampanoag native, uh, language native to Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard, uh, which had ceased to be spoken in the 19th century. As a colonial object whose primary utility had been extinguished for over a century, the Eliot Indian Bible emphasizes the forgetness of material history, albeit one that comes freighted with cultural baggage. Uh, with regards to the theme of this conference, this paper thinks about linguistic data in the sense that languages, grammars, and vocabularies are cultural repositories. They encapsulate worldviews. The legacy of the Eliot Indian Bible points to larger questions about indigenous linguistic knowledge. Uh, to think about this, we can ask three questions. Uh, to what end has linguistic data been used? Uh, how open should uh, the, this data be? And what are best practices for stewarding this data? Historically, the collection of linguistic data has gone hand in hand with colonial practices, for example, Christian missionizing. The production of the Eliot Bible coincided with the creation of the Harvard Indian College which was a little known cultural experiment of the mid 1600s. Uh, the college was largely unsuccessful uh, despite being written into the founding charter of America's first institution of higher education. Only one student ever graduated and there were no more than four or five students in the history of the college. Uh, but, the press use, uh, but the press used to print the Eliot Bible was housed in the college and the Bible's production was the largest print undertaking of the colonial period. Missionizing to the indigenous population of Massachusetts was something written into the chart of the colony as it was elsewhere in the Americas. Uh, we see this same type of linguistic capture in other parts of the globe. Uh, the a Hawaiian translation of the Bible was also the one of the first primary texts printed in Hawaii. Uh, the first uh, item printed in Hawaii was actually an alphabet and grammar, and immediately afterwards, um, people set out to translate the Bible. Uh, and this is one of the main rationales for indigenous languages um, 
language acquisition in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, here's just a glimpse of some of the translations of the Bible um, after Eliot. And it remains the impulse of a subset of linguists today. Uh, this is the SIL, which is previously called the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Uh, it's a major hub for linguistic study, and faith and service is their main focus. Uh, so what's changed is a title shift towards uh, the valuation placed on indigenous languages that began in the late 1960s. Within the field of linguistics, there was a renewed emphasis placed on indigenous languages, and Kenneth Hale is part of this a revolution in this field, uh, which is part of a larger project to establish a universal grammar, um, which is an impulse inaugurated by Noam Chomsky at MIT. Uh, Hale was brought to MIT specifically to expand this research through the comparative analysis of non-Indo-European languages. Uh, here he is learning Walpiri in Central Australia. Uh, it's one of 70 um, Aboriginal languages that he documented in his career. Uh, Hale launched an academic pathway for training indigenous linguists at MIT soon after his arrival, uh, and he directed the dissertations of Laverne Jean and Paul Platero, who completed their PhDs in 1978. They're believed to be the first two American Indians to obtain doctorates in, linguists, in linguistics, not only at MIT, but anywhere. Uh, and one of the last hallmarks of Hale's career was the arrival of a student hailing from Mashpee, Massachusetts, which is regarded as Cape Cod's Indian town. In 1992, Jessie Little Doe had a series of dreams. For three consecutive nights, she encountered a circle of people who looked like her, speaking a language she couldn't recognize. A lifelong resident of Mashpee, she later passed a Cape Cod roadside, a road sign for the neighboring village of Sipuiset, and seeing the traditional Wampanoag writing, she realized her visions had been about Wampanoag, the language that her ancestors had spoken when they encountered the pilgrims at Plymouth Plantation. Uh, but just two centuries after the Mayflower's arrival, her language had fallen out of lived memory. By the fall of 1996, Jessie Little, though, had been accepted as a community fellow at MIT, and her interest in language reclamation brought her to Ken Hale's office, and they set to work reconstructing the language that same afternoon. Despite having no prior language training, she formally enrolled in the Masters of Linguistics program a year later. The key resource uh, for their language reconstruction work was the Eliot Bible, which is a translation of uh, the Geneva Bible, which was favored by the pilgrims. A textual analysis of the Bible provided 60,000 base words in Wampanoag, uh, whose meaning had to be deduced via comparison with the original English. Much enriched by her uh, linguistic training at MIT, um, the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project was not without its detractors. Uh, when they first applied for an NEH grant, um, one reviewer expressed serious doubts as to whether or not the project could deliver, uh, writing, quote, I regret to have to be so brutally frank, but the idea of reviving a language not spoken for a century is simply preposterous. Uh, but the, uh, the project persevered. Uh, a first draft of the Wampanoag Dictionary was delivered to Ken Hale who was uh, sick with cancer at the time in 2001 by his successor at MIT. And for the, after the first decade of work, the dictionary contained more than 11,000 words. Uh, in 2010, Jesse Little Doe was named a MacArthur Fellow. And in 2017, uh, as it's pictured here, uh, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of science from Yale alongside uh, author Nugu Wathiango, uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry, Steve Wonder, and civil rights icon John Lewis. So privilege as part of MIT's rare book collection, the Bible is a relic of history. It's part of a colonial project that had the consequence of the, destroying the language in which it is set. It exists now as a linguistic time capsule, one that we collectively are still trying to figure out how to unpack. And to give you a sense of the weight of Eliot's colonial legacy, uh, he's actually valorized in the rotunda of the Massachusetts State House. Uh, here he is uh, preaching to the Indians. Um, this is, I actually haven't seen this in person, but it's part of the mythos of, of the state. Um, although MIT's copy of the Bible was fully digitized in 2009, the absence of protocols and historical context has prevented it from being disseminated online, although it's actually uploaded by the Internet Archive and other sources. Um, so this brings me to the APS, since the APS has a long-standing history of working with sensitive cultural materials. Uh, this is just an excerpt from the APS's protocols for the treatment of indigenous materials. 
and we're currently working to try to um, figure out how best to present this material to a public audience. So questions of consent from stakeholder communities have been at the forefront of our discussions, but as a textual assemblage, the linguistic data reflected in the Bible is complex. Although it's colloquially called the Wampanoag Bible, linguist Norvin Richards is quick to point out that its actual vocabulary reflects interactions with communities throughout Eastern and Central Massachusetts. Uh, the person who has historically been obscuring, obscured in its printing history is a Nipmuc man from, uh, or who took the name James Printer and worked at the press in Cambridge for the majority of, of his life. Uh, and despite this, his name only appears on a title page uh, once. So in closing, when we think about these linguistic data, uh, the Elliot Indian Bible and Kenneth Hale's papers call into question how sensitive material should be made public, if at all. Uh, we must ask what constraints should be put in place to ensure that the afterlives of collected data are properly managed. Uh, at the same time, Hale recognized the significance of historic language repositories for language reclamation. Uh, he viewed the sum of these materials as essential for recognizing the full scope of human experience. As Anak Olin, a recent indigenous master's student at MIT put it, uh, the wisdom of my ancestors has been preserved in the language. If we lose our language, we lose our ability to see into the minds of the people who were able to thrive for millennia. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you all. And thank you all for sticking to the time, which gives us lots of time for questions, which is always the best part of these panels. And I hope you all agree, uh, including uh, those of you who are streaming in. Um, in one of the earlier papers today, uh, from um, uh, Fisher and Curtis, uh, they raised the question, uh, or the idea that the goal of uh, their work is, in some sense, to give humanity to these people rather than reducing them to data points, which is a very nice idea, and it's also something that occurs in some of the work today. So I wanted to ask um, the panel a basic question starting with, with that idea. Um, in Molly's paper, you talk about emotional weight of engaging with the data. And uh, in um, uh, Amanda and, uh, what's your first name? Gina, thank you, <laughs> sorry, you didn't hear that. Uh, in Amanda and Gina's paper, uh, you talk about uh, the problem of uh, ethical weight. So these are weighty topics, emotional weight, ethical weight. Um, in some ways, uh, you might think of it as shifting from the value of quantitative details to the value of qualitative details within data sets, which is an interesting question we haven't talked about yet. And I think it's relevant to all of your papers, and I just wonder if any of you have any thoughts on that question of emotional or ethical weight. Hello. Um, I was also thinking about this question when it was posed this morning, so I appreciate that you bring it up again. Um, I, I definitely think that it's really important to engage with, with, with the emotional, the ethical, but moving from quantitative to qualitative details in data and in data sets, um, for sure, and that's kind of the, the end goal for me when I'm looking at this, not just, you know, is the number that I find in my data set different than the others because that's just scratching the surface for me. Um, I think what's more important to me is providing as much of the written information on each person who has passed away due to the 1793 epidemic as possible and potentially doing research or um, having it be part of a larger research project with undergraduate students researching each person, especially with how rich uh, citizen data is in Philadelphia in this period of time in the 18th century. Um, so I definitely think that it's uh, especially important um, and I think that's something to keep in mind, especially given that there's so much uh, discussion within the DH world around um, 
yeah, thinking of data as dehumanizing um, or thinking of things quantitatively as, as removing kind of the human aspect, and I want to do more of the opposite. Great. I'll take a first stab at answering this question in the context of our project, and then, Amanda, I'll pass the mic over to you. Um, so thank you for a great question. I think we've been fascinated to see different facets of the ethical considerations around reusing um, historical data for science emerging as we go, and we haven't even gotten to some of the most important ones yet since many of our participants are not dealing with data that directly represents human beings um, or their biological information or anything um, sort of explicitly or directly about derived from their existence. Um, instead, um, most of the projects that we've encountered are studying um, biological phenomena or climatological phenomena, but we would never suggest that that doesn't mean that um, these data, whether in their original creation or in their um, recovery and reuse, don't have significant bearing on the lives of people in the world today and in the future um, or in the past. So the dimensions we're seeing are, are, are many. So we're seeing things like um, where the data originally came from um, and how they were originally gathered affect the communities that existed in those places at the time or um, affect their knowledges. But we're also seeing things like um, how the data were originally gathered are completely divorced from how they're intended to be reused. So the new ethical question is, um, can they be reused um, not only in a way that's scientifically valid and rigorous, but that doesn't do any harm either to the communities the data were affecting in the past or the communities that they may affect in the future? The scientists who are doing the data recovery work are acutely aware, I think, of many of the ethical conundra. They're the ones who are exposing them to us as we interview them. Um, and, the, and the archivists and librarians, data curators, those who have been sort of professionally trained and, um, and indoctrinated to understand the ethical concerns of data representations are even more so. So we're just learning a lot about what this looks like, particularly for data that are not directly um, or obviously about people um, in the way that humanities data often are. It also occurred to me in thinking about um, kind of these as you mentioned, these like qualitative dimensions of, you know, in in the case of like the scientific data that um, our project focuses on, um, the the qualitative data in that sense or quantitative data in that sense. Excuse me. Um, there's still the the people that we've talked to like there's still these like human factor. So even if we think about it as quantitative data, there's still these human factors um, related to that data and which people describe as trying to um, represent in the metadata, specifically like how people, how scientists got to, um, got to an observation um, and how they generated those, um, those pieces of information. Yeah, I'm thinking about my specific experiences at uh, MIT, uh, where I sit on an institute committee, um, or the Committee on the Library System, and one of our tasks is to draft documents. For example, we're currently working on an open access uh, statement uh, for the uh, institute to adopt. And as the sole humanist on the committee, there's no sense among my colleagues that certain types of data shouldn't be accessible, uh, and I just keep having to throw out examples to them. Uh, so for example, Juno Diaz is on the faculty. Should all of his works be open access? Um, and they, it's just something that they can't really wrap their heads around. So it's an ongoing discussion that we're, we're currently having. Thank you, just uh, one more question. One of the nice things I like about this panel is that it actually uh, involves people from a wide variety of disciplines. Uh, so we have um, a historian. Uh, uh, Amanda, I think you were trained in anthropology initially. And of course, Katrina is an information scientist. And then uh, Corey is that 
wonderful thing I mentioned earlier. Your degree was in modern thought and literary studies, so uh, I think that pretty much covers it. My question is about disciplinary differences in approaching these data topics. I know, and somebody pointed out earlier, a librarian will have very different approach to data sets than will a historian. And here we also have an anthropologist, which raises a whole nother question about engagement with some of the data sets we've talked about today, not just the ones you're actually dealing with. Um, I wonder if you, each of you might just say a word or two about how your approach as a discipline, within your discipline, it might differ from what some of your colleagues might do, um, or any aspect of the disciplinary specificity of your projects that you'd like to comment on. Thank you. Um, well, as a historian, um, it's I think the way that I've approached this data and this data set is, is kind of uh, taking a step back from the data and contextualizing it in terms of the period of time in which it was collected in its very la various layers as data that was collected in the 1790s and then revisited in the 1960s and 1970s and then now me as somebody in 2022 revisiting it for with you know kind of the digital background and I also have a, a degree in biology as well and so I try and put on the different hats of scientist and historian to kind of approach data so I think the the historian hat on um, I tried to contextualize like why this data was collected at this period of time, where else can I go to fill in the gaps if possible, and if there's a way of doing that and doing that seamlessly, or what information do I need to describe if I'm putting two data sets together, and that kind of adds the digital humanities aspect. But I'll, I'll, the last point I'll make is that I think this, this question of interdisciplinary approaches is necessary to, um, working with different data sets, I think, across the board. So I, I think the digital humanities and kind of data and digital data and, and all of that is, is very um, uh, collaborative in, because you need different perspectives. So even if you're coming at it with one perspective, it's always so useful to think of different uh, disciplines to help, I don't know, study that data even more. Uh, great question. It's one I kind of wanted to pose to many of our panelists throughout the day today, um, particularly with the sort of, you know, interdisciplinary perspective that our project is trying to take. Um, so I think, you know, coming from library and information science, um, we are trained, is, is, is a sort of dual research um, and professional or practitioner degree. Um, we are trained in... Um, supporting the use of knowledge and in creating resources that are highly accessible and useful to people over time. So, um, you know, from, from our perspective, starting this research project um, in partnership with a library, with the National Ag Library, and um, coming from an information sciences department, um, we were interested in looking at curatorial practices the way we'd understood them um, from library information science, which is to say, as focused on supporting the open-ended reuse of data. So any possible use um, over an indefinite period of time with the data adequately preserved. Um, and that's not the same tack that the scientists that we work with are taking to data curation. Obviously, what they're trying to do is answer a specific question for their own purposes. And that's true for many of the humanists in the room here. Um, Although I think because of the public facingness of much digital humanities research, there's more attention to the open-ended possibilities of reuse. And we've heard that discussed on panels today. Um, so what it means when a project is doing curatorial work but with a specific research question in mind um, is one of the things we're trying to study because it's quite different from doing curatorial work trying to support open-ended reuse. It affects things like how, how you document and describe the things that you're finding. Um, which in turn affects whether they can be reused for science and, or for different, um, different kinds of research questions. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is it's closely related, which is just that um, we came in with a strong focus on future use. I mean, the whole point of data curation is to support the reuse of data over multiple life cycles. Um, but the scientists we work with and many of the humanists I've worked with in my other research in the past are less attuned to um, sort of reuse down the line or preservation. So, so we're hoping to learn more about what we can give and what we can learn from these different disciplinary practices and, and it focuses. Oh, 
<laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. So, yeah, in, in building off of that, um, you know, your question brought up, um, brought to mind this, we, because we've interviewed um, digital curators, libraries, or librarians, information professionals, um, and all of them are interested in, they're, they're interested in making things, um, as Katrina mentioned, um, you know, accessible for broad use. And, and on, also like on the scientific perspective, um, the, these librarians have talked about how sci scientists um, have often maybe described hesitancy um, related to sharing, um, sharing their data and thinking about um, kind of the different, um, the different values and kind of risks that um, scientists encounter when, um, when putting their data into, um, into the world accessibly and digitally. Yeah, I'm reminded of the story of the seven blind men and the elephant who are sort of touching different parts of the elephant and feeling different things uh, in thinking about our project at MIT because we have a historian of the book, a linguist, an indigenous scholar with a background in anthropology, a data, science, a data scientist, and a library specialist uh, who all bring different perspectives and also uh, subject matter expertise to bear. Uh, so, in a way, we have to have a lot of discussions, but um, being able to talk across disciplinary boundaries um, makes our work better, and hopefully we'll um, make for a final better product once we are able to present it to the public. Great, so should we uh, turn to the audience? I might start us off as we're thinking about, oh, we got people to go. Uh, David, we'll go with you first. Oh. Sure, why not? Um, so I have to thank Kyle because he put this word in my head earlier uh, during lunch, but um, I'm thinking about so often when we're dealing with the past, when we're dealing with historic phenomena, we're dealing with uh, loss, that's what Kyle gave me, silence, absence, things that can't be recovered. Um, I had a question in my mind for Molly, but I'm trying to expand it to the whole panel, so forgive me a little bit. Um, my own background is in German studies, and we talk a lot about the Holocaust, obviously, kill the mood here, and um, the fact that six million Jews were murdered. But of course, that's not true. We don't know how many Jews were murdered. We know about six million were. But when you say six million, of course, that's a form of historical loss. That's a form of absence because there are more people, less people, we don't know. Molly, in your project, you're recovering names, which is sort of a way of trying to, I guess, get around this problem of loss through quantification. But um, I, I just kind of want to think more about how we work with historic data sets when we have to be honest to these questions of loss, absence. I think this is relevant to all the papers. Data rescue obviously being an attempt to stop loss or prevent it or go around it. And then, of course, with the loss of living tradition of a language. So I just wonder if you could comment a little bit on that explicitly. Kind of a very broad question. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Thank you so much. I can answer really quickly since I know you said that the question was initially for me, um, and I appreciate this question a lot. And I think I think uh, your comments on you know the Holocaust and thinking about this as like of a form of of absence and loss and silence and you know its relationship to data rescue is is really uh, a good way of of thinking about this. I think for me. Um, because I think an aspect of this is like uh, is, is thinking about like commemorating or recognizing the memory of these people that have been lost. But f another way of thinking about it, or the way that I have approached this this data set on uh, this mortality data on 1793, is also not necessarily data rescuing, but preservation. Because the data, I think, you know, has been out there, but just preserving it in another way, but also. Um, I think revisiting it to see where more of the silences are, um, because I think part of my argument with this presentation and with this paper and the way that I've been like sitting and thinking about this data is that um, these numbers are just kind of replicated, um, and I can't speak for every single person who has written on the 1793 epidemic, but um, you know, do we dig into the extent of that silence and that loss? Um, 
um, as much as we should, instead of replicating a number or thinking, oh, how many people died? Oh, 5,000, okay, moving on to kind of broader analysis of this epidemic. And just, again, like having, living in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, just thinking of the ways in which that we're thinking about this silence, this loss, and, and kind of either recovery or at least uh, memorializing that. So that's something that, that's how I'm kind of grappling with those questions that you pose, but thank you. I'm, hes I'm hesitant to even attempt an answer to this question in the context of our project because um, it's coming from such a different angle, but I guess what I will say is one of the things that's um, another another sort of ethical concern to, to also speak at the same time to your first question to us around um, the sort of visibility of the labor that goes into this data rescue work. I think it's something that's talked about a lot in the humanities and now that this sort of practice of data recovery is becoming a little more um, widespread and influential in the sciences is sort of a new conversation to have there and takes a, a different shape. Um, so one thing that's lost is sort of an understanding of the different conditions under which these data were originally produced and then um, are being sort of reproduced and reused um, in their new in their new contexts. Um, but so, for example, you know the the labor of of archivists, of librarians, and data curators um, is that sort of you know it's often understood to be a less scholarly value than the work of people who are doing the research directly, so it's often made um, less visible. Um, but then also the scientists who are doing data recovery work, this is work that is not sort of, outside of very well-funded and very well-known initiatives like crowdsourced um, data recovery and climatology or anything happening like on the Zooniverse platform, um, and the ethics of crowdsourcing labor being a whole other sort of set of questions. Um, this work is often sort of being done as extremely tedious and dreary work, um, thumbing through pages and copying down manually numbers out of charts and graphs, and it's often done by people on projects who won't get a lot of credit for it, um, or, um, or um, whose, whose contributions to the scientific record just kind of won't be documented in and of themselves, especially if the data aren't then made accessible or preserved. Um, so a different kind of loss maybe, but another angle worth considering. And this, this question about loss, it made me think of um, one specific interview where um, one participant described how even just like delaying publication, delaying writing about a project is a loss of data because you're coming back to it with um, with kind of a, a different perspective. Um, it won't be your thoughts about that data aren't as um, might not be as rich in detail as when you took that data um, and it was generated through a project. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, not so much loss, but absence uh, in, in thinking about the um, Eliot Bible. So for example, we refer to it as the Eliot Bible. Um, his name is prominently displayed on the title page. Um, because of the history of um, contact and conflict between um, the native population and the colonists, we don't actually, and I, I'm talking about King Philip's War, uh, we don't actually have any surviving copies of the Eliot Bible that displays any sign of um, indigenous use of it. So the surviving 100 copies that um, exist uh, in various institutions uh, exist because these um, predominantly white institutions have held on to what you might think of as vanity copies uh, that persist in the historical record. But um, there is an absence of other types of use that historically were there, but we have no record of it at this point. Um, I, I have a question for uh, everybody on the on the panel. Uh, maybe it's a little different, but they might all make sense at, uh, at once. So the first one's for Molly, and it's very similar to what uh, David Nelson just asked. Um, and I was struck by the final number you showed on COVID, which was about 6 million deaths, 6.2 million. And that number also is almost certainly a, an undercount. Uh, you know, we, we just don't know and probably never will. 
But that number also relies a lot on extrapolation, um, where we have statistical methods where we're able to estimate, we think with some accuracy, what, what that number will be. And I just wonder if in your own work and your own background, if you've thought about how some of these statistical methods might be in other fields like you know, uh, dem demography, uh, probably epidemiology, could be applied to your own work. And I know in some ways that is going against what you're trying to do, which is get away from the raw number and get to the individuals. And I also want to maybe push you a little bit on, on that, where when I've given talks about the American Revolution, one of the things that gets people's attention more than anything is sometimes a number. When I say one out of every three Americans either had somebody killed or injured in the war, all of a sudden that's relatable. And so I wonder what, you know, if you want to think about how numbers can also be really, really powerful tools and more accurate numbers and how to get more accurate numbers historically. Um, for the, uh, for uh, Katrina and Amanda, uh, at the APS we collect a lot of scientific materials. And one of the things I'm always surprised at are, is how m many scientists don't think their data is useful. And they often either throw it away before we get it or want us to throw it away or assume we'll throw it away. And it just strikes me of a discipline, and this gets at the interdisciplinary, a discipline that, that relies so heavily on data, they're then so dismissive of old data that it's their own. And I just don't know if anecdotally you have any like, thoughts on that, of why that is the way it is, or if you've encountered it and how to counteract that. Uh, and then for Corey, I, um, I was really surprised. At, uh, it's interesting to me that MIT, you know, the Elliott Bible is available in so many different formats, in so many different places. Uh, the text is available, uh, images of it are, are fully available multiple places. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, MIT's internal debate on why they won't release it, what the um, issues are that they're confronting without getting into maybe specific issues of cultural sensitivity, but more generally? Um, sure. Um, so MIT digitized a lot of uh, their rare book collection back in 2009, um, and there's just a sense of, this is not specific to the Elliott Bible, but there's a sense of uh, needing to provide context for something before just putting it online. This is very different from, say, the Internet Archive, which just digitizes and puts stuff up. Um, and the other thing is um, a lack of um, technical capabilities. Um, so MIT is a um, highly ranked academic institution, but in terms of its spending on libraries and access to resources, I think it ranks somewhere in the f like 50th or 60th in the nation. So um, yeah, it's, it's sort of weird to think about uh, how the libraries at MIT sort of punch above their weight in terms of how limited the budget is. So that's, yeah, it's, it's just specific to, th to the institution. So that's a great question for us about, um, about why scientists may not see the value in their data and pointing to another sort of dimension of why sharing is so difficult for them. It's, it's um, partly about recognizing value and partly about being, being willing to do the work of description and documentation and data cleaning to get it ready for sharing. And when we're talking about historical data, the sort of the, the fundamental questions are completely different. I mean, many of the data sets that we're recovering were never originally intended to be shared. Some of them, because they are sort of in the you know papers of retired scientists, for example, which are being which are being archived to document the history of science, but not necessarily meant to be shared as computationally amenable data for supporting new scientific research, um, or maybe. Um, so maybe not shared as such, or maybe they were intended to be shared, but only in a, a certain form. So they were published, but um, for a particular audience of a particular journal. So maybe aspects that would be documented for sharing with a wider audience are not because they're sort of presumptive or default um, parameters for a given field or something like that. Um, so lots of reasons scientists are reluctant to share, and one of them is that they have concerns about their data quality sometimes. So they don't think that the data that they have stored in masses on their hard drives is necessarily publication ready, or they're acutely aware of problems that exist in a given field or a sensor that malfunctioned on a specific day and that's not represented in the data set in some way. Um, so there are all kinds of attendant problems with um, 
and all of these are curatorial problems with trying to reuse data from the past um, absent certain critical documentation. And we talk a lot, and these, and these are uniquely problematic from the perspective of the sciences. So what is it, how much context is required to make something actually re replicable or, or actually reusable in a new context for answering or, or for um, confirming a fundamentally different hypothesis? Um, so I, anecdotally, have we seen it? Yeah, we have. I, I think most of the people we've talked to are working on sharing, and we've been asking them about their sharing practices. So we're asking them about their recovery efforts or their efforts to share data more broadly. Um, so it's sort of a biased data set. We don't get the ones who refuse to share or the ones who are you know, disinclined to deposit their materials in an archive. Um, but I would, I would love to hear more. I have in other research on information practices of science um, stumbled across this exact phenomenon of concern and how we accommodate that in curatorial practices for open data, whether that should be a serious concern about sharing data from the past. I mean, definitely, yeah. Anecdotally, something we've also come across in the interviews is um, kind of this assumption of academics as individuals, individual researchers. Um, and so I think, and I mean, I think th there's been a, this assumption of me within my graduate programs um, and others and my colleagues. I have um, friends who have wanted to uh, co-author theses, but because of the structures of the the institution, um, um, they, you know, that that's not possible. A thesis has to be solo authored, and I think, I mean, it's I think it's true across like the the disciplines that I've been a part of. But something else that has come out in the in the interviews is that like research is like you create your own like if you're calling it a data set or like the research materials you're working with. Um, and in the sciences, there seems to be kind of an assumption that sometimes that often there's an assumption that you create your own data set. Hi, thank you for those questions. I'll answer them very briefly, but I'm happy to talk at another time. I'm just aware of the time. So to answer the first kind of question or point about extrapolation for numbers or thinking about folks who do biostatistics or, or kind of epidemiology and using that in this context, I definitely think about it. I actually have a really close friend who does that work with COVID stuff during like when the pandemic happened, we were actually talking about how relatable our work is. Um, and I think it's all about kind of the process of it. So I think it's definitely, it has its place and it's useful. And of course, I really rely on a, like Cristobal Silva's work and the way that he uses epidemiology to study, you know, 17th and 18th century New England by using this kind of contemporary analysis form and the way that he is kind of arguing that for his book, um, which I highly recommend. Um, so I, I think about it in, the, in that way as like kind of process, but I think to go to the second question, for, I understand that numbers are extremely relatable, but I think I want, I personally want more out of that. So if you're saying like one out of five or 5,000 people died out of how many, like is there more narrative to add to that more or to add that kind of more human aspect of it um, or kind of a spatial aspect, like what does that actually look like and what does that uh, seem like more? So instead of just saying a number, um, or, or think about things in terms of numbers, like how can we use or create data sets that say a little bit more to give more context for, for users and reusers to, to use that term, thank you. Well, I think this has been an absolutely fantastic panel and there's gonna be lots for us to talk about. I am told there is also fresh coffee. Oh, <laughs> but Bob, did you wanna have the final question? Okay. <laughs> you get the uh, APS prerogative. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So here I am, uh, and I'm going to ask a question that maybe nobody can answer, but I'll address it to the folks on the panel and uh, anybody else who cares to enlighten me. And the question is, what is history? When does history begin? Think about modern astronomy and astrophysics. Almost all of the observations are about events that occurred many millions or perhaps billions of years ago. Two of the big database uh, talks uh, projects that we've heard about today, the Domesday book and the redlining book, are, are 
fundamentally, although they've been, the data have been created recently, are fundamentally about events that happened a long time ago. I spent much of my career studying men who were, the, the oldest of whom were born around 1908, but yet were of contemporary interest in the mid-1970s. But that's history too, I think. So when, when does his, in the APS, there's a class structure of membership. And class three includes behavioral, social, and economic sciences, jurisprudence, and history, quote, since 1776. That's modern history. It used to be, by the way, 1701, I think, until fairly recently. And then there's another class completely that studies history before that date. So all data come from the past. When does history begin? Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> Although you might be disappointed because there's a very easy way I could answer your question, which is just for the scope of our project which is to say that the curation concerns become very different when the original creator of the data is not available anymore to answer questions. So the whole, you know, the whole goal of data curation work in general is to make data independently understandable. It's a term of art in our field, which is to say to make it understandable without reference to the data's original creators. Um, and so we're focused on data that are what we call either historical or defunct, <laughs> which is to say they're not actively being used anymore. And in most cases, um, talking to the people who originally gathered them um, or otherwise created them is impossible. Um, so that's my easy and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm dodging your question a little bit um, because I think the question's much bigger. Um, and I'd, I'd really love to hear from others about it. If only there was a historian on the panel. <laughs> I think that history starts in the past. And that's all, that's all I think I can say. Because, right, there's arguments. Some folks argue that does, does history start when humans, you know, exist. And, right, things happen before that, too. So, like, I would say that just history is just the past. And seeing the past and studying the past, no matter how far back that is. So... That's my answer to that big question. <laughs> I think Corey's been saved by the claps. Um, so, uh, one more question. Here we go. <laughs> One thing that's come up again and again throughout all of the panels, which I think is really interesting, regardless of everyone's discipline or where people are coming from, is context. And as an archivist who is constantly doing something with context, um, I just think that's really neat that um, everything just continually comes back to context and bringing everything together. So I just want to. Excellent addition.